Young people in China are really facing a tough time nowadays. I heard that the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress in China is currently reviewing a draft law on patriotic education, aiming to emphasize patriotic education for teenagers and children. Chinese young people now have a new assignment, studying Xi Jinping thought. Yes, schools, the internet, and even your WeChat moments are all focused on helping you understand Xi Jinping thought. Well, your life is like an endless political science class, with Xi Jinping as the teacher and his writings as the textbook. Want to skip this course? Sorry, there's no skip button. Well, it's a good idea, I must say. They seem to be quite good at studying since all the top six spots on the bestseller list in China are occupied by books written by Chairman Xi. It seems like they really love their country. However, loving the country doesn't solve all their problems. They still need jobs, they need to live, they need bread. Let me tell you, the youth unemployment rate in China has already exceeded 20%, the highest level in history. Do you know what that means? It means that one-fifth of young people cannot find work. I'm really worried that they will end up wearing graduation gowns but only being able to work as gig workers. What shocks me even more is that the birth rate in China is also declining, and the population is decreasing. By 2035, the population of people aged 60 and above in China is expected to reach 400 million, accounting for nearly one-third of the total population. This is no joke. It means that Chinese young people not only have to bear the responsibility of supporting their families but also carry the enormous burden of elderly care. Do you know why young people nowadays don't want to have children? It's because the cost of raising a child is 6.9 times the per capita GDP, which is the highest in the world. Some people say that local governments have introduced birth subsidies to encourage childbirth, but let me tell you, a few hundred yuan in monthly subsidies is like a drop in the ocean for young people who have to spend hundreds of thousands or even millions to raise a child. It simply doesn't meet their needs. It's like buying a luxury car and then being given a discount coupon for gasoline. You might think, thank you, but I may need more help. Do you know what saddens me the most? Recently, a 21-year-old Peking University student applied for over 80 jobs and hasn't received a single acceptance notice. Do you know how eager college graduates are to find employment? There is even a municipal institution in Hangzhou, Zhejiang province, that openly recruits finance graduates from Zhejiang University to work as non-staff drivers. This is truly a blessing for college students. It reminds me of that famous saying, master math, physics, and chemistry, and you'll fear no place in the world. Now it seems we should modify it to, master math, physics, and chemistry, and you'll fear no place as a driver. I don't know what's going on, perhaps it's just an isolated case, but it undoubtedly serves as a wake-up call for our young people. You need to work harder, be more resilient, to face this complex and ever-changing society. Otherwise, you may find that your degree only helps you secure a job as a delivery driver. So you hung your bachelor's degree on your electric bike as your delivery rider certificate. Lastly, let's talk about the recent trend of death graduation photos. This is a new way of taking graduation photos where students dress in graduation gowns, wear graduation caps, and lie in various corners of the campus, as if they were already dead. Do you know why they do this? It's because they feel like zombies, dealing with the pressure of the COVID-19 pandemic and facing the reality of not finding jobs. This is their zero life, zero COVID cases, zero job opportunities. And what is the Chinese government's solution to these pressures? It's to send them to western regions, to those sparsely populated areas. They say that the cost of living is low there, and there are more job opportunities, which can solve the problems faced by young people. What do you think, is this a good idea? In recent times, there was a brief mutiny in Russia's Wagner Group, which undoubtedly drew the attention of the world. However, some countries' reactions in this political storm were somewhat unexpected. Let's start with Kazakhstan, a country that was previously considered to prioritize its relationship with Moscow. Their cool response to Putin during the mutiny made it feel like watching a cold-hearted version of Game of Thrones. Kazakhstan seemed like a character sharpening their knives behind the scenes, waiting to seize their own interests amidst the chaos. Now let's take a look at China, a country that the Kremlin believed had the obligation to provide support, but only issued a fairly brief statement after the situation reversed. It's like watching a serious political thriller where you never know what choice the protagonist will make next. However, the most interesting part is the reaction of Chinese netizens. They used ancient anecdotes to mock Wagner's brief rebellion, as if watching a modern version of a costume comedy, which would make you laugh out loud. One internet user wrote, the Chinese version of Qianlong's rebellion is back in Russia, as if in Lucian has risen again, approaching Moscow with great momentum, only to reveal his true identity as Song Zhang.
One cannot help but admire the wit and wisdom of netizens, who, with their unique perspectives and humorous language, have added a sense of lightness and fun to this political storm. Within these humorous comments, we can also see some criticism and teasing of Putin. Some questioned whether he is still the Putin of old, and whether Russia is still the Russia of old. In these comments, we see not only the intelligence and humor of netizens but also their profound understanding and independent thinking about the current political situation. Undoubtedly, this has added a sense of enjoyment and color to our lives. Of course, we cannot overlook the impact and challenges that this event has brought to Russia and the world. Whether it's Kazakhstan's indifference, China's hesitation, or the mockery of netizens, they all pose challenges to Russia's political stability and international image. We will continue to follow this topic and provide you with the latest news and analysis. According to reports, Russian intelligence agencies are investigating whether Western spy agencies were involved in the Wagner mutiny. U.S. President Biden stated, We made it clear. We had nothing to do with it. We and our allies are in agreement that we should not let Putin blame the mutiny on the West or NATO. The Chinese leadership cannot afford to have a chaotic situation arise on the China-Russia border. China continues to openly express support for Russia. Kurt Campbell, the White House coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs, stated during a forum at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, on the 26th that Russia's recent brief mutiny has unsettled the Chinese government. The Wagner mutiny that occurred over the weekend is the most serious challenge to Putin's power since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February last year, while China has responded to it in a low-key manner. Experts suggest that China may reassess its relationship with Russia. Communist China is an enemy. It is the most dangerous foreign threat we have faced since World War II, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, said in a speech at the American Enterprise Institute on Tuesday, as she vies for the Republican presidential nomination. Haley also stated that the U.S. should unapologetically stand with Taiwan, and that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would mean a complete economic decoupling between the U.S. and China. Republican candidate Haley criticized Trump for showing moral weakness in dealing with China and Xi Jinping. Republican members of Congress are urging the U.S. to cancel its technology agreements with China. In early February of this year, the U.S. shot down a Chinese spy balloon flying over its airspace. After concluding his visit to China, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken stated that the balloon incident with China should be the end of it. On June 26, the British media BBC published an investigative article in collaboration with the artificial intelligence company Synthetaic, which screened a large amount of satellite-captured data and discovered multiple images of balloons flying over East Asia, including over Japan and Taiwan. When do you think the Chinese spy balloons will end? China's plans to establish military facilities in Cuba and the revelation of long-standing listening posts have caused a major uproar. Military analysts believe that China may turn Cuba into an intelligence hub, and its economic, intelligence, and military activities in the broader Latin American and Caribbean region pose a significant threat to U.S. interests and leadership. This Tuesday, Chinese leader Xi Jinping met with the visiting New Zealand Prime Minister in Beijing, and it is expected that U.S. Treasury Secretary Yellen will also visit China next month. Scholars point out that there is currently a consensus in the international community on policies towards China, and cooperating with China does not hinder the need to address challenges. New Zealand Prime Minister Ardern expressed enthusiasm and constructiveness in her meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. She stated that the discussions primarily focused on economic issues but also covered a range of topics including U.S.-China relations, the Ukraine conflict, Pacific regional issues, and human rights. She reiterated New Zealand's stance on these issues and urged China to use all possible influence to end the conflict in Ukraine. According to a press release from the New Zealand Prime Minister's office, Ardern discussed areas of direct cooperation between the two countries in trade, education, science and innovation, agriculture, and tourism during her meeting with Xi Jinping. Australian media reports that during New Zealand Foreign Minister Mahuda's visit to China in March this year, she received a lengthy lecture from Chinese Foreign Minister Chin Gang. Mahuda responded by stating that it was a frank and forceful discussion. On Tuesday, U.S. State Department spokesperson Miller stated in a statement that Deputy Secretary of State Sherman had a phone call with Chinese Ambassador to the U.S. Xie Feng. They discussed key priorities in U.S.-China relations and a range of global and regional issues. Sherman reiterated the importance of maintaining open communication channels between the two countries and noted that the U.S. will continue to use diplomatic means to address areas of concern and potential areas of cooperation between the U.S. and China. Bloomberg reported on June 27, citing sources, that U.S. Treasury Secretary Yellen plans to visit China in early July. White House Deputy Press Secretary Olivia Dalton did not confirm this news during the White House press briefing on the same day.
However, she reiterated the importance of establishing multiple communication channels with Beijing to ensure that U.S.-China relations do not evolve from competition to conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu is scheduled to visit China next month and will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping. This will be Netanyahu's second visit to China in six years. It emphasizes that the U.S. remains an important ally. The Securities and Exchange Commission's Investor Advisory Committee held a roundtable discussion last week, and according to speakers at the event, the Biden administration is preparing to draft an executive order that would impose controls on venture capital and private equity investments in China and other countries considered rivals by the U.S. Sequoia Capital can be considered the most stable and profitable venture capital firm in history, having made significant investments in both the United States and China. However, the company eventually found itself having to choose between the two. The U.S., Japan, and South Korea are preparing for a summit in August, focusing on the threat posed by North Korea and China's hegemony. According to Japanese and South Korean officials, U.S. President Biden, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio, and South Korean President Moon Jae-in are planning to hold a formal trilateral meeting in Washington at the end of August. The meeting will address the situation in East Asia, including discussions on North Korea's nuclear and missile development and China's hegemonic behavior. Chinese leader Xi Jinping's visit to the China National Museum sparked sensitivity in Sino-Japanese relations when he mentioned the historical ties between the independent Ryukyu Kingdom, present-day Okinawa, Japan, and Fujian. Beijing's intentions behind this move, whether it is a strategic move or a mere coincidence, remain uncertain. As the U.S. and Vietnam draw closer, Chinese unease grows. Chinese State Councilor and Defense Minister Li Shangfu met with Vietnamese Defense Minister Fan Van Jiang in Beijing on Tuesday, June 27, expressing a willingness to strengthen military cooperation and safeguard the interests of both countries. After two Chinese military aircraft approached the Penghu Islands of Taiwan within 24 nautical miles, approximately 44.4 kilometers, the Taiwanese Ministry of National Defense reiterated that if any flying, naval, or other entities from the People's Liberation Army approach Taiwan and warnings are ineffective, the Taiwanese military will exercise self-defense and counterattack. Chairman Mike Rogers of the U.S. House Armed Services Committee led a delegation to visit Taiwan for three days starting on Tuesday, June 27. They are expected to meet with senior Taiwanese leaders, including President Tsai Ing-wen, to discuss U.S.-Taiwan relations, regional security, and other issues. China has accused the U.S. federal court of convicting three individuals involved in the fox hunt operation, claiming that the U.S. has ulterior motives to defame and discredit China's efforts in pursuing fugitives and recovering stolen assets. However, according to the conviction documents and existing U.S. laws, these three individuals did violate U.S. laws. Germany, France, and Italy announced on the 26th that the three countries will engage in closer cooperation in the field of raw materials to reduce dependence on China. The French Minister of Economy stated that if establishing European legislation is the first step, then today's meeting is an opportunity for government-to-government -government and industry representatives to exchange views and go further. Previously, the European Commission proposed regulations to reduce Europe's dependence on imports from countries like China. Meanwhile, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, who recently visited Europe, attempted to convince the West that China is not a risky country. Premier Li attended the Summer Davos Forum on Tuesday and delivered a keynote speech, expressing confidence in the Chinese economy while criticizing the Western concept of economic decoupling from risk. He pointed out that reducing dependence and decoupling is a false proposition, and countries should not politicize economic and trade issues but let companies make their own decisions. He also stated that China's economic growth in the second quarter of this year is expected to accelerate, with a target of achieving 5% annual growth. The Hoover Institution recently published a report stating that the Chinese Communist Party's General Secretary, Xi Jinping, has an almost obsessive interest in the economic and social influence of the Internet and big data. Under his rule, the Chinese party state system is trying to use corporate expansion to bring massive amounts of data from around the world to China, in order to enhance China's intelligence-gathering capabilities and manipulate foreign influence. Olivia Chow, born in Hong Kong, emerged victorious in a fiercely contested mayoral election in Toronto, Canada, becoming the city's first female mayor of Chinese descent. With 37% of the vote, the 66-year-old Olivia Chow defeated 101 other candidates. As a representative of the left-wing progressive movement, Chow has expressed her commitment to building a city that is more caring, livable, and safe. Chinese financial writer Wu Zaobo has once again been banned from Weibo. Wu Zaobo is one of China's most influential financial writers, known for his best-selling books on China's economic transformation and his contributions to Kaishin Media. Some Chinese netizens are asking, 
Why was Wu Zaobo banned? Was it because he spoke the truth? In a time of uncertain prospects for the Chinese economy, economic commentary has also become a target of censorship. Last year, economist Ren Zeping was also banned on Weibo for advocating for the central bank to print more money and encouraging childbirth, among other remarks. Standard & Poor's has lowered its GDP growth forecast for China this year from the previous 5.5% to 5.2%. In its statement on the 25th, S&P mentioned that the downside risks to China's economic growth are primarily due to weak consumer and real estate market confidence, with the recovery losing momentum. This is the first time this year that a global credit rating agency has downgraded China's economic growth rating. Previously, several investment banks, including Goldman Sachs, also lowered their GDP forecasts for China. Zhang Yuzhou, director of the State-Owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission of the State Council of China, said on Tuesday, June 27, that China's economic growth still faces many challenges. He hopes that China can respond to global economic uncertainty with its own certainty and contribute to global economic growth. Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, HKEX, has launched its dual counter model for RMB settlement. The first batch of 24 dual counter stocks can now be traded in RMB, accounting for over one-third of the total market value of the Hong Kong stock market. Currently, the proportion of transactions conducted in RMB is less than 1%. China Mobile is an exception, as since the launch of the dual counter model, approximately 10% of its transactions have been settled in RMB. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, is considered one of the individuals who best understands global capital trends. BlackRock CEO Fink recently stated that the company's funds are shifting from China to Japanese stocks. BlackRock manages around $9.1 trillion in assets for global investors, providing investment trusts for investing in global stocks, government bonds, corporate bonds, and more. Competition in perovskite batteries. Japan invents, China leads in mass production. Perovskite solar cells are thin and flexible. The invention technology comes from Professor Ryotaro Miyanosaka of Tuan University of Yokohama, Japan, but it is Chinese companies that are leading in mass production. Due to the high costs of applying for patents abroad, Professor Miyanosaka has only applied for some basic patents in Japan. China National Petroleum and Natural Gas Pipeline Group announced that a successful 9.45 MPa full-size non-metallic pipeline hydrogen burst test was conducted recently at the National Pipeline Group's Pipeline Rupture Control Test Site in Hami, Xinjiang. This marks the successful completion of China's first high-pressure multi-pipe material hydrogen transportation pipeline intermediate process application test, providing technical support for large-scale long-distance hydrogen transportation in China in the future. Open Black Lens Bracket Kai Guo Chang's designed fireworks show takes place in Fukushima Close Black Lens Bracket on June 26, the city of Iwaki in Fukushima Prefecture, which was affected by the 3.11 earthquake in Japan held a fireworks display designed by world-renowned contemporary artist Kai Guo Chang, who is originally from China. 40,000 fireworks, symbolizing hopes for the repose of earthquake victims and the resolution of the Tokyo Electric Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, lit up the daytime sky in a brilliant display. Hello everyone, I am your news anchor Yali, here to provide you with a one-stop service for China-related news every day. This is something you won't find anywhere else. If you have any thoughts or opinions on these topics, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. We will carefully read and respond to everyone's comments. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. That's all for today's news update. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time, take care, everyone.